thought it was a... The laptop with a little, like it was like a pimple right in the, between the keys. I thought it was an eraser stuck in there. So they <laughs> I was trying to pull the eraser out of this laptop showroom at Best Buy. And you, did you got, manage to, did you, no, did you break it or did you get no, kicked out? No, I got yelled at by the, uh, by the salesman. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, somebody stuck an eraser in your keyboard, man. Why did like, you start this already? I did start it. We're not, we didn't even talk about what we're doing. Well, has that ever stopped us before? No. You were an anecdote, so I wanted it. You wanted the anecdote. That's silly. It wasn't Anytime even a good anecdote. Anytime you're documenting getting thrown out of a Best Buy, like you don't know where that's going to go. It could have gone a lot of <laughs> nothing, places. Nothing awesome happened. I just, and then I got in a fight with him. <laughs> I just got reprimanded when I was Said I'm going to Circuit City. <laughs> Circuit City. Take my business to somewhere, an institution that will endure. <laughs> oh, Circuit City. That's like Kmart. Circuit City is to Best Buy as Kmart was to Walmart. And none yeah. of those references mean anything to the youths of this. Do age. they still not? Do they, they don't have Kmarts anymore, do they? I don't think they do, man. I don't think so. Like, it's not even like a, it's like a small town scenario where like there's these little like there's like shop co's and pomidas and like weird little. Yeah, it's a it's like a smaller. I know. I've been to a yeah. pomida. OK, now they're all just Dollar Generals, I guess. Right. Those are bad, too. Oh, don't go. Do not. I don't use your credit card at a Dollar General. Do you not have a dollar? Like, what was the what was well, the problem? No. Who uses cash anymore? They didn't I'm, take all, I'm all about the Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, no, I've tried to use my uh, my credit card at uh, Dollar General, and like, okay. and my wife and I like three times in a year got our stuff stolen. We like got our, our number stolen, and uh, yeah, and we like tracked it back. It was like every time it was like three days after we were at Dollar General. Just like Jesus was in the tomb for three days. Not really. It's the probably same. the same thing. Probably not. <laughs> All right. Well, it was uh, a tepid, since you... it was a tepid drink. Yeah, we're recording. Should we actually I know. talk about well, Mark today? Well, because you started so early, so we can't have our normal 20 minutes of banter beforehand. So well, we're, we're bantering. Let's get to work. I just want to see what it'll... we'll banter afterwards. Once all the Tom listeners Waits has... is ready tuned off all right so we, we were plugging away um and, and this one i actually had to study for because i really really love the section we just did where jesus healed boy with the unclean spirit i believe help my unbelief and this it's one, just this one I, I decided to study for guys <laughs> well i <laughs> you make it sound that way it sounds true and uncomfortable well, you um just yeah said it. like no, the other I, 18 I, of our episodes guys <laughs> i didn't even bother but this one just wing this it this one I, t I check well because <laughs> as we dive into this, this is stuff that he has already done and it seems uneventful but we're gonna we're gonna take a look at it anyway because this is the uncultured saints and if we didn't draw it out into a ridiculous amount of podcast what would we be doing with our free time something productive probably, i know so uh, the congregation <laughs> Mark 9, beginning at verse 30, instead of that, uh, they being the disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he being Jesus did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who is the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon afterward be able to speak evil of me. For the one who is not, for the one who is not against us is for us. For tough. truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. This is the word of the Lord. I thought there? it was going to go the other way. Yeah, let's stop right there. Okay. I really hope we're going to get through all of nine because, my goodness. 
three three episodes for chapter nine would be a little really rough. ambitious of you. A um, little rough. It depends how long we talk about Kmart. Um, or yeah, Kmart. Or so Jesus already told them he was going to die and rise, and they didn't understand it before. And he told them he didn't. He was going to die and rise, and they didn't understand it again. Like what's what's the what's significant here? I was going to ask you that question because I mean he's done it. He did it the first time that Mark mm-hmm. recognizes. I can't remember it was chapter six or something back. Uh, it was a while ago. This yeah. is what G- uh, Peter has the correct confession and the incorrect uh, confession all at the same time, right? right. You're the Christ, the Son of the Living God. Um, also, also, let's talk about how to do your job. <laughs> don't right. don't die in a cross. Right. Also, bad. don't don't go to the cross. Right. Um, and they also are told at least three of them, right, coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, like specifically, right. Don't, um, uh, uh, don't tell anybody until I've risen from the dead. Right. Right. Uh, so that's at least an allusion to, oh yeah, I'm going to die and rise from the dead again. Don't let anybody know till afterwards, which mm-hmm. they, they don't like question him because they still don't understand it. And now Jesus says this again. Um, right. And they're, uh, they're not in Galilee anymore. They're coming down into Israel uh, for whatever it's worth, the first it seems like the first uh, uh, death and resurrection. I got to get my phone away from me because it's buzzing. It's bugging me the whole time. Um, the the uh, uh, the first one was in. I want to find out who is calling you later. <laughs> with the Gentiles, he uh, just chucked it across. <laughs> that was that was my uh, that was one of the vice presidents of the Rocky Mountain District who was doing that. Um. <laughs> Anyhow, he was texting me. He wouldn't stop. No, I lost my place. Go ahead and do whatever you're gonna do. Go. <laughs> it was just I was just along for this ride. <laughs> well, the thing that stood out to me was that he didn't want anybody to know that he was passing through Galilee, and that's a significant thing. This, Why? this, well, because before it was a very public healing and demon casting outing kind of ministry, uh, and this is uh, it, it seems to be a place where there's a turn where Jesus is is directly directly addressing the apostles, uh, the the twelve, and I, I think that maybe something to push on here is, is this this understanding that Christianity is a world changing thing versus Christianity is a is a you changing thing. Um, everybody sort of wants to co-op Christianity into being, you know, we, we want a bread king Jesus. We want a healing Jesus, a demon casting out in Jesus, a political activist Jesus. And, and he's talking about going to the cross. And this is very different. And, and it actually, again, clarifies what the problem is. The problem is not just that there are sick people. The problem is, is not just that, that there are bad politicians or, any, or poverty. The problem is that you're a sinner. And, and so he needs to die for you and, and rise again from the dead. And underneath that, we can start to address sickness and, and demons and politics and all those things, but if we're not going to hit the root cause. And, and so here Jesus is cutting short all those things to, to just go after the cross. So, Oh, yeah. Well, then, then why do those things in the, in the first place? I guess that would be the person's, uh, you're right, the, the listener's question, right? Like, mm-hmm. And it seems to be the, the, the apostles or disciples' question as well, uh, or I, I would think it would be, right? Like, hey, and I'm just cutting down his ministry halfway i don't know what it was but let's pretend like hey for the what's first shorter year, than the book of mark because this is no, taking too long go no yeah. no but hey for the first year and a half jesus like it took us a long time to understand this but man you've been doing some pretty awesome miracles right you're feeding mm-hmm. people uh with bread and stuff and you're healing stuff and that's awesome they're finally kind of getting it understood and like then there's a transfiguration which we kind of see uh uh you know in retrospect we can kind of see as the as the turning point mm-hmm. um but they don't get that yet right and so they're jesus comes down the mountain and and the apostles are still like hey like we should be able to cast out demons jesus what's <laughs> going on here um and uh, you're right he's just he he isn't at least from mark's perspective in his gospel what he wants to put forward is jesus it looks like jesus's um main thing has kind of turned perhaps um, so why the miracles to begin with? I mean, I, I don't think you can disconnect the cross from the miracles, but the, I think that we keep trying to. I, I would say it's like that. Um, that that the miracles happen because God is merciful to sinners. Uh, when when He comes across somebody who is suffering, He He wants to help them because He loves us, even though we be sinners. The problem starts to be when we start saying God is merciful to sinners, but but rather we want that stuff. Um, if the, the, 
if the miracles get de de detached from the cross, then it, it becomes a very different religion very quickly. But, but rather, when you talk, every single individual miracle has a cost. Every single undoing of sin has to be paid for, and that happens at the cross. And so every healing, every demon casting outing event, um, every last thing was a down payment on Jesus bearing the cross of Christ, uh, bearing the cross for sinners. So, but I don't know. I, and now I'm just being a, a jerk, but I, I don't know if That's you answered nice. my question. I, I'm trying to. Um, but I mean, why why do it in the first? Because he did. It seems like he didn't do it afterwards. It seems like in the book of Acts, the the, the gifts of uh, healing kind of peters out, um, mm -hmm. uh, or John's out, or Thomas is out. However you want it... to. Um, <laughs> That's clever, and I don't like that you. Clever. <laughs> um, I actually have to give you credit for that one. No, I, I think it's actually that there's a point in time where the miracles start detracting from the thing that they're pointing to. Okay. That, See, I think that's where I wanted to go to, and, and stealing from from uh, the Gospel of John, and I'm sure we've said this at some point in our discussions, maybe not in this season, but um, I like how John, when he uh, speaks of his what we would consider miracles, he never uses the word miracle, but he only uses the word signs. sign. Right. That's close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, that. Go. So that that the signs uh, are they're good in and of themselves intrinsically because God is doing good things obviously uh, mm -hmm. and and healing and and, and all of that and, and taking care of uh, specific uh, instances of the fall uh, which is all important uh, without a doubt let's not pretend that it isn't but John sees them and wants us to know of them as signs of who Jesus actually is so that then. We could say, oh, he isn't just a miracle worker in the temporal sense, but his cross actually puts an end to all of these things, not just mm -hmm. temporally speaking, but but in a, in a vertical way as well, in an eternal sort of way. And and to kind of carry it forward, I think this actually has to do with the rest of uh, that little section that we we tackled, um, because the disciples are arguing along the way who is the greatest, and Jesus sets a little child among them and says, um, "You have to receive this child to receive me, and to receive me is to receive the Father." Um, that in the same way that uh, we want a, a Jesus who does the sign but not the cross, uh, we also want representations of Him that that do important things. So the disciples are are still trying to measure, you know, like how how close to Jesus am I by how many demons can I cast out and and who is the greatest to, to be the best apostle and we don't even need to sort of make it a, a wholly selfish thing although I think it might have been um, that these disciples were arguing but rather like who is the best seminarian and who's going to do the most good for the church uh, who, who is the one who, who gets the, the best grades in Greek uh, and how can we sort of carry this forward into a way that's going to help people and Jesus overhears them arguing about who is the greatest and rather sets in front of them uh, the least of these the, the most helpless the one who can accomplish the least, the most needy, and speaks and, and says that this is actually a place where um, I am inherently tied. He says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And this, this reminds me of the Lucan version of this, he who hears you, hears me, and he who rejects you, rejects me and the one who sent me. That, that your pastor is not the greatest, but he is the little child, but, but to receive your pastor who speaks for Jesus in the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins. That's to hear Jesus. Yeah, the best seminarian was probably clerical James. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, probably without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, made us all feel real dumb. Uh, <laughs> real dumb. And real still and does. pious. Yeah, still does. <laughs> and still does. Uh, <laughs> Um, so what, okay. So what about the, what about the, uh, the, the, the pie dot, the little children thing? Because, uh, I think there's probably something culturally speaking and across the, the millennia that we miss here, right? Because in our culture, I mean, you know, minus the whole abortion, murdering babies things, we actually think babies are really super important. Right. And the, we set, uh, we set the, the babies kind of on this pedestal as they're the most important, right? <laughs> Abortion is not funny. Don't laugh about it. Just, so, the, just the way that you just let that footnote go was actually the way. So, uh, so for all, uh, when we, when you have an infant, right, you you care for it. You 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 believe that it's one of the most uh, important things, and your most important job is to like give it everything that you need, right, mm -hmm. um, or, or everything that it needs. And so uh, the 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 child, the infant, uh, it seems to take center stage. Um, and that's how we kind of view this. And so when we hear Jesus saying he takes a little pied on a little child, a little nursing infant and puts the it precious, in the precious cute. Right. 
It's a, yeah. Of all one. Right, exactly. It says, oh, yeah, you got to accept what's these. And everybody's like, well, of course, why wouldn't we? What, was that the mindset of the apostles? Well, I mean, you also just reckon with, I, I mean, it, it's it's maybe under best intentions. Let's just deal with the, the cold realities of it, that the infants are the hardest to keep alive in the midst of famine and war and and, and trial and, and everything that well, is especially back then, the world. Right? Especially back then, because for we, sure. Because again, America, we our, our infant mortality rate is, is minimal, right? But, but that's actually how we tend to judge what sort of world, first, second, third world country you are. That's one of the main things is what is the infant mortality rate? How good are you at keeping babies alive? Well, I, can, um, I guess that depends on how you... Yeah. Abortion you gotta, and... Put a big old asterisk, right. I suppose, on those figures. Right. But at the same time, um, when, when you mark it this way, though, it's, it's a recognition uh, that that at its core, this is not an independent being. This is not a, a self sufficient or a greatest being, but but rather this is this is one who will constantly be a tax on resources. Right, and and so in so in so viewing it that way, like you know. Uh, it was it was just common knowledge that that the the child a tax on resources if you want to look at it that way uh, you know half the time the baby's going to die all right it's not going to make it to adulthood all of this sort of stuff but then also um, the, it, there seemed to be this just this cultural understanding of uh, uh, children are seen not heard um, they're not the most important things uh, you wait until you hit a certain age and then you've then you've kind of uh, got this social. A cultural status that that then you're 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 moving your way up the rung, right? Right. Um, in in the same ways when um, Jesus uh, uh, chastises his disciples for uh, shooing away the moms who are bringing little children to mm-hmm. Jesus, they might bless them, right? Um, this this is probably a normal kind of thing. Like if there's babies and kids around, you're like, get them out of here, get them out of here. Jesus flips flips the script and says, no, no, no. Right. Uh, uh, let the little children come to me for s- uh, such belongs the kingdom of God. And again, we in our uh, 2020, whatever uh, uh, American mindset think of, oh, the innocence, of course, the, ch- yeah, the kingdom no. of God is the no, the kingdom of God is the uh, 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 the the kingdom of God belongs to these kids because these kids are utterly helpless. And if you want to uh, receive the kingdom of God, uh, you must receive it as a little child, as a completely utter utterly helpless individual who can't lift a finger to save yourself. Right. But then to receive that is to receive Jesus. Um, And to receive Jesus is to receive the Father. This, uh, as the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest, and they're going to immediately transition into, yeah, but there's other people doing it too, and we didn't approve of that. Like there's this big sort of push on what should a pastor be? And Jesus is is sneaking away from the crowds and addressing only the disciples, only the pastors. And he's talking specifically about what the pastors are going to have to endure and then preach. And then he specifically starts to undo their mindset of what a good pastor should be. Uh, I, I think it's important to, to reckon with the fact that the church has not been upheld by the greatest ever. Um, and if you read church history with any sort of um, acumen or, or, or even just sort of like a, a the acumen of a 12-year-old YouTube atheist, uh, you'll reckon with that there's there's bad people in the church and there's stupid people in the church. And yet the church has endured not because uh, that the rest of the world is even dumber and has been convinced, but rather because the Holy Spirit is at work inside of the church to produce a hope where rightly it, it all should have been squashed out. If, if Christ is risen from the grave, though, if Jesus really did die and then on the third day rise, that's enough for the church, even if there be little children uh, that, that are, are its, its representation, the least of these, the the vilest and dumbest of these. Yeah, it's just a whole different mindset that he's trying to get across to his mm-hmm. apostles. And through them, eventually, you know, through the book of Acts and through the their, their preaching and teaching to to us as well. It's just it's a whole different thing. It's not a rational uh, understanding whatsoever. It's uh, rational in regards to it, it, it makes temporal sense to us. Um, right. But Jesus it, keeps going back to I'm going to die and on the third day rise. And that also it seems to defy said ration, rationale. Right. Right, exactly. Which is, again, why they don't really understand that. Like, if they've never actually seen that happen, and nobody really had. And, 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 and it's again... It's still an impressive event. It's still... 
It still is. And, and, and again, even if you go back to the, uh, the Old Testament where you get, you know, Elisha doing it and stuff like that, and, and you get, uh, I believe Jesus has already done that once uh, here in Mark as well, right? So mm-hmm. uh, they've seen Jesus raise somebody from the dead, but there's never been an instance where somebody's raised themselves from the dead. Yeah, that's right? fair. There's never been that instance. And so when Jesus, the one who is raising people from the dead, is saying, I'm going to die and then I'm going to rise again, this, it just doesn't make sense. It's just, it's just no, you need somebody else to do it. And I don't know why you're dying anyways. You're the Messiah. And like, could we just stop? You, this is the second time you said this, Jesus. It, it doesn't make much sense. I'm not going to say it out loud because I saw what you did to Peter. But could we just, um, you know, right. talk about some cooler things and your death? Ugh. So yeah, how as to a be request, a better Christian every Sunday. Um, let's finish the chapter though. So um, then John is also upset because there are other people casting out demons. We need we need more demons in people. You can't have just everybody doing this thing, right? Um, so w- w- how Jesus is is against that, but why should we be uh, against what? Against what John's saying? Yeah, against uh, other people well, casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Jesus isn't against that. John, the apostle. No, that's what I'm that. saying. Jesus is wildly against that. So why should I agree with Jesus? Wildly against what John is saying. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, well, John, John's just, instead of uh, Peter, because Peter's probably maybe wisened up a little bit here at this point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but John, John for once is kind of like, hey, like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, like we just came down from the mountain and I know I was up there and, and I didn't see this person. And maybe if I was down here, then I would have been able to get this demon out. But Thomas couldn't, right? Uh, so uh, now we've got Rick over here and we don't even know where Rick's, we don't even know Pastor where Rick. Rick's from. It's Pastor right? Rick. He's casting out demons and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You didn't tell Rick to do that. How dare you? How dare so- he? How do you know that? Like, like this is actually something I was curious about. Like, if there is just sort of like a whole sort of spinoff series to the gospel, um, that where we could we could follow around Pastor Rick uh, as he casts out demons along the countryside, um, and then Rick... jumps over a shark on some water skis. I'm sure would be the next step to the spinoff. Yeah, but then um, but then the spinoff would be over, right? Because yeah, you, know, you can't jump the shark. No, but on. I mean, so first, let's if the demons are being cast out in the name of Jesus, Jesus is aware of it because it is Jesus who is doing it through them. Well, that's the thing, because what what is John? The, the key thing here is what what is John saying, right? We should be the only ones who get to do this. Well, stuff. not only. Yes, that's what for him. That's the key thing. But he is he's uh, um, uh, he's tipping the hand on why Rick is able to cast out demons. Right. Hey, uh, teacher, we saw Rick casting out demons in your name. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. before it would it would it would uh, appear as if the the way in which Jesus talked about it earlier in this chapter, when the other when the apostles couldn't, is mm-hmm. they were trying to do this in their own name with their own right. authority and with their own power. And what's John's concerned about is here. No, I'm an apostle. Darn it! Like I'm the one who gets to do this, not Rick. And that's what's important to him. Not that a demon is being cast out. Not that somebody is free from the clutches of of, of Satan, um, but that he's the one who gets to do it. Right. It's a definition of the church question. Is the church where the important people are making the right decisions, or is the church where Jesus' name is being preached and sacraments are administered? And and if that's the case, that's enough for the unity of the church. If if the word is tr- preached in its truth and purity, the sacraments are administered according to God's institution. God be praised. Right. Right. And we got that example. Uh, we're probably uh, reading the same commentary. So we, we, we both saw, but we got that same uh, example in the Old Testament with the prophets, mm-hmm. uh, 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 well, the elders, right? The elders who were able to uh, prophesy on Mount Sinai and a couple stayed back in town mm-hmm. and uh, they were able to do it there. And everyone's like, ah, what? <laughs> they weren't up on the mountain. I know they're speaking the truth, but meh, let's not have them speak the truth. So let me throw this rock in there then. Okay. Um, uh, in light of this, because I think somebody probably could take this example or take the example of, of Mount Sinai and say, well, why do you need a pastor? Aren't you pastors taking the, uh, uh, the, the sacrament and taking the preaching and saying, no, I'm the only one who gets to do it? Pastor Harrison Goodman, why, why can't uh, uh, Rick climb up in a pulpit and just start preaching? 
Well, if Rick is the one making that decision, then again, it's Rick doing it in Rick's name. Um, we're, we're making a pretty dangerous assumption from silence that um, if they are doing this thing, that they weren't sent. H- how do you know that? It, it, it nowhere says that they weren't sent. Like we don't get to know this spinoff story. I'm actually really curious about it in the last day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and find uh, Pastor Rick and ask him, like, tell me about your adventures and who sent you. But, but we actually have the idea that God would work through people and he would set aside specific people so that you know that it works. Uh, but you're right. Um, if, if there were no pastors anywhere, uh, the people would appoint one. But the thing that would actually do this is that he was sent by God to do it. And so what would matter is still, are you preaching the true word of God or just what you think it is? is and, and second are you administering the sacraments according to god's institution or are you just up there doing this in your own name now if you have just decided god told me i'm the pastor here and i should be the pastor here now so listen to me this is really simple let's check it so um the the dogmatic way to approach this is that the church has uh, recognized the speaker of God in, in two ways throughout history in the church. There's the mediate call and the immediate call, the, the call through means and the call apart from means. Now, the mediate call is uh, simple. That, that's the way that you were called or the way that I was called, that, that, that the church has spoken the way that the church has historically spoken and said, you're the guy. And so if you ever wondered whether or not we should listen to Pastor Litzow or Pastor Goodman, it's not on um, clearly uh, their their intelligence or behavior, but, but rather God sent them and you can check with the the church. But the immediate call um, is the one that uh, goes for the prophets. And and this is one you don't see so much anymore. So first, the prophets, um, are are, this is where the sky talks and says, go do this thing now. Um, So the prophets, uh, Abraham, things like this, when you're called immediately to serve the people of God, first, your testimony is in accord with the rest of the word of God. So you're not sent anything new that disagrees. Uh, And second, you do signs and wonders. So if, if, if you do think that you can just sort of climb in the pulpit or just start your own church, I would say if, if you're not speaking on behalf of the church, do a miracle and then show me that you're teaching in line with the rest of the word of God. And in which case I would gladly listen to you. It's almost as if uh, we're wrapping this uh, uh, you know, full circle and uh, the miracles were signs of the authority of what is being taught. Right? That's weird as if this were actually given with purpose and intent and it's not just sort of the ramblings of of some right. thousands and, of years and ago. so and so pastor rick here isn't it, it and and we don't know if it was immediate or immediate call but this let's play the 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 game that it was immediate um uh, that the You're casting holy spirit, out demons yeah the holy spirit descended upon him and said go and do this and now he's casting out demons yeah well that's a pretty good sign mm-hmm. right you, you beelzebul cannot cast out beelzebul Jesus has already stated that, right? So it has right. to come from God. Well, then that's just, John, just simmer. Simmer mm-hmm. down. Simmer down. You think we can deal with cutting your hand off for the Lord uh, in three minutes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It would be better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to an unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out for it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched for uh, every Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt is lost, it's saltiness. How will we make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of the Lord. Ooh, thanks be to God. So yeah, so let's let's talk about where Jesus was talking about the church, and then Jesus was talking about the church, and then Jesus was talking about the church, and now behave or cut your body parts off. Well, that's or maybe this is about the church too. It could be. Uh, so okay, well let go with it. This How is excommunication. This you is excommunication. So? I do believe this is excommunication first okay. and foremost, because if I were, if I really thought that I could like be sinless by plucking out eyes and cutting off hands, I would just be like a crippled sinner who thought dumb things. Um, it, the, the sin is not actually in, in the hands, but in the heart. Jesus himself says it is what comes out of the heart of a person that defiles him. And nowhere does it actually address that. Uh, also, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We're going to hear a rant down the road uh, about uh, some of you will get to be the eye and not all of you get to be and, and chill about it. Um, if, if there is somebody in the body of Christ, in the church, who is dragging the rest of the church to hell, it, it's sad. It, nobody's happy about it. But it would be better that the whole congregation, the whole church not be dragged to hell, but, but rather that the person who is unbelieving be cut off from the church. It, it's excommunication. Yeah, I, could, I can get on board with that. Um, I mean, it would. I, 
if if it's not, then Jesus is being very uh, metaphorical uh, uh, in in regards to how you are supposed to uh, deal with your own uh, your own self, right? Um, but even with that, then uh, let's say it's it is speaking about the individual. Um, uh, at the very most, as you had said, Pastor, that uh, uh, if if this is true, and I'm supposed to start mutilating my my body that causes me to sin, then I'm going to end up just a just a torso, right? That's it. Um, and, and like gonna, uh, and then I'm like gonna, a Monty Python, and right, just sort of hop after right. people, and then eventually I'm just going to have to lobotomize myself because it is my brain and my heart that's actually causing me to sin. Uh-huh. So I mean, it, it, in that way, Jesus very well might be saying, "Yeah, you're going to end up dead. Like you're going to hack off every single part of your body. You can't do this in and of yourself." Um, so it could be a very, uh, uh, a, a very demonstrative law spoken on. You're not going to be able to do this on your own. Um, but then also the other layer of the onion, maybe the better one, as you had, had described it, would be the, the understanding of the church as a whole. And and so this causes you to sin as the English translates it. I don't think it's probably the best because it's it's more along the lines of scandalize, right? It's more along the lines of, of bringing somebody into unbelief type. Thing, right. Right. This, it, and, it, and that's the language for excommunication. But it's not sinners that are not welcome in church. Right. Right. So it's it's it, if if somebody if the eye is causing the whole body uh, to stumble down this path of unbelief, get that eye out of there as fast as possible, right? If Can we that, like go ahead. practically lay that out then? So like if if the eye keeps confessing the same sins in church over and over again, we should pluck it out. Or if the no, eye no. is saying, "Don't believe in Jesus anymore," I have right. a way better way. Right. The if word you, of God is not something that you can trust. And, and we could start at the top. If you got somebody in the pulpit who is not uh, preaching and teaching uh, justification in its proper sense, uh, or or the the truths that we express in the uh, and confess in the Trinity, uh, that uh, that should be brought to light in front of him. His error should be made known. And if he doesn't say, "Oops, yeah, I'm sorry, I should have said that better," uh, and fix it. Uh, then, then you take it to the uh, proper authorities. After that, right? You take it to right. uh, the council, the DP, whatever your your church ecclesiastical uh, system is, um, so that that individual isn't in the pulpit teaching you false doctrine, which eventually is going to lead you into unbelief. And then you can just you can extrapolate that out into anybody else's life as well. Not the mm-hmm. individual who is struggling with sin, uh, but the individual whose life is continuously and unabashedly and unrepentantly um, uh, leading himself and others into unbelief. Right. And that lets us talk about salt too, because I, I want to equate salt with belief in this then. Um, belief is good. Um, if, if, if you have lost belief, that that is problematic. Um, but the idea that, that Jesus would close us out by saying, be at peace with one another. This is like, I'm not more at peace with you if I'm just sort of a torso that is hopping after you, still real mad at you and trying to duel, uh, or at least as, as classic film would lead me to believe. Um, but, but, but rather... Um, shrubberies um rather the, the recognition that we are the body of christ individually and and that isn't it together by faith that faith is good we, we should have that faith if, if there's something tearing away faith that's bad for church yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. without a doubt okay that bunny's scary in that movie yeah yeah a lot of stuff is great about that movie <laughs> monty python Quest for the Holy Grail. Is that one kid appropriate ish? There's some bad parts in it. Mm. Viewer discretion is advised. I'll take it. We out. You are listening to a Higher Things production. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving, or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents The Uncultured Saints with pastors Eli Leedsow and Harrison Goodman.